Welcome to the Christmas Eve online service from Johns Creek Presbyterian Church. Friends, this day, this Christmas Eve is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. These are unusual times with the pandemic. Because of that, we are unable to do the drive-in worship Christmas Eve services that we had planned. For now, we'll only be having the online services for the next two Sundays, on December 27th and January 3rd. So please join us online, and then we'll update you when we begin meeting again on our campus. But thank you for understanding as we work together to make it through this pandemic. You can continue to support the work of our church here at Johns Creek Presbyterian Church by giving online. You can just click the, the Give Now button and do that. Of course, you can mail it into the church office. The address will be at the end of the video, or you can drop it by the box in our Welcome Center. And uh, I want to let you know that if, as we are approaching the end of 2020, in order for your gifts to count for tax purposes in 2020, we either need them postmarked by December 31st or in the Welcome Center drop box. Of course, giving online provides a way to do that without any delay, but I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your generous giving in 2020. Uh, this time of year, we have what we call the Christmas Joy Offering in the Presbyterian Church USA. It's a special offering above and beyond to do two things. One is to help retired church workers in their times of need, and secondly, to help build leadership at our Presbyterian schools among communities of color, both worthwhile things. We encourage you to give to that. You can do it on our jcpcusa.org website, or you can go directly to the pcusa.org website and give to the Christmas Joy Gift Offering. Finally, we're going to be celebrating communion during our service this day. So you may want to stop the video and go and get some bread and grape juice or wine so that you can celebrate along with us. Friends, now let us prepare our hearts for the worship of God. Would you join with me in our call to worship? Was ever there such a night when stars shone bright, when angels formed a heavenly chorus and shepherds quaked? Was ever there such a birth when a baby's cry meant God is now here? Was ever there a moment like now when we let the majesty and simplicity of the story touch our hearts, when we draw closer to the family and God, when we sing with deep feeling and overflowing joy? Oh, this is the night, and the story is still told the carols still sung, and something new happens again and again. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. We light this candle to proclaim that Jesus is the light of the world. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let all the 
John's gospel reminds us that God so loved the world that God sent Jesus into the world whose birth we celebrate at this time of year. But God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. With that in mind, let us join together in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, your love and power transform death into life, fear into hope, lifeless stumps into tender shoots, and a tiny baby into the Prince of Peace. In the hearing of your word and the repenting of our sins, transform the hardness of our hearts into lives of receptivity, following the one who came to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ comes to remind us that God saves us and forgives us and offers us God's forgiveness and grace. Friends, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Behold God's 
Our scripture reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. As we read this, listen for the word of the Lord. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire world. That was the first census that took place when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're looking at the Christmas story as found in Luke's gospel. The title of this message came directly from the words that the angel said to the shepherds, be not afraid, be not afraid. I think this story speaks to how we might view the coming of Christ into our world in which there seems to be a lot of fear. And we may wonder if there is some hope for those of us who sometimes struggle with fear in our lives. And thinking about all of this, I remembered an article I read a while ago in the Wall Street Journal that talked about how we react to fear in our lives. So I I went back to search the Wall Street Journal website uh, and searched for this article on fear. What shocked me was how many articles I found with the word fear in either the title or the main focus. I had to scroll through pages and pages of articles just to find the one that I was looking for. Clearly, there's a lot of fear in our world today. All we have to do is look at the newspaper, the the TV, or pull up our favorite news source on the internet to see that. These are fearful times. This fear almost feels like a low-grade fever that's lurking in the background and won't go away. Well, the article I was looking at focused on some of, um, some of the understandings that we actually as human beings seem to seek out scary things like certain movies or roller coasters or gambling or extreme, support, uh, extreme sports that give us a thrill. Researchers are wondering if some brains are actually wired to seek out those kinds of experiences. One researcher said this, Humans have a unique situation where we seek out things that scare us. The article went on to talk about how fear can be helpful. For example, to warn us against things that could really hurt us and it prompts us to run fast and then evaluate later. But the body and the mind react to fear, even in movies, as if the fear was real. The heart races, the blood flows to our muscles, the stress hormones prime the body for action. But the researchers also suggested that some people love things like scary movies 
because it gives them a safe context in which to experience the thrilling sensation of fear. Uh, some parents say that they see these tendencies in their children, which can appear even when the child is very young. One expert recommends to those parents that rock climbing with close supervision might be a good outlet for such kids, but he adds, mostly those parents are just hanging on for dear life. So we know that there are scary things in our world, that some of us may even seek them out. <laughs> but what does any of this have to do with the Christmas story we've just heard from Luke's gospel? Well, at the time of the birth of Jesus, there was also a lot to be afraid of. When Caesar Augustus could decide on a whim that he wanted to collect more taxes, he spoke the word and everyone had to go to the town where they owned land to register so that they could find out how much money they owed Caesar. And if you did not do that, there was always the power of the Roman army, armies to back up Caesar's demands. That was one thing to be afraid of that we read about in our story from Luke's gospel. And later on in Luke's gospel, after the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, King Herod is so threatened by the idea of a new king that he has all the baby boys under the age of two killed in Bethlehem. Yet another reason to be afraid. It was a fearful time to live. Yet it is into that world that God sends the child Jesus to be born, who is God in the flesh. And when the angels find those shepherds out in the fields at night watching over their sheep, the first words they say to these shepherds are, Do not be afraid. Or the traditional, be not afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but if a real angel from God appeared to me in the middle of the night, I would probably be afraid. We all would, I think. Unless maybe we're one of those people who, whose brains are wired to seek out things like that. Yet I believe this message to be not afraid goes much deeper than just some words to calm down some surprised shepherds. I think they speak a profound message we all need to hear this Christmas in 2020. Be not afraid. Now, when we think about fear in the Bible, we know that the word can mean different things. In the beginning of Luke's gospel, when the angel appears to Mary and she is told that she will have a child by God's Holy Spirit, the message is the same. Be not afraid. Throughout the Bible, we are told to fear not and that the Spirit of God is not a spirit of fear. What we mean by that is this. We do not need to fear God because we think God is out to get us or do us harm. We don't need to fear God because we think God may be out to get us or do us harm. Instead, the overall message of the Bible is that God loves us and that God is at work in the world to bring about healing and wholeness and meaning to our lives. <clears throat> now, we may ask, but aren't there parts of the Bible that talk about the wrath of God? I mean, that seems pretty scary. But even in those places, God's anger is how we as human beings choose to do the things that either hurt others or ourselves. In the same way that we might be angry at our kids if they did something to hurt someone else or themselves, for example, if they, they got drunk and, and drove a car, we would be angry because of the harm that they could do to someone else or to themselves. In a similar way, I believe God's anger is a response to our not living in ways that love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So even God's anger is couched in the larger context of God's love and what is best for each one of us. 
But God is not out to get us. Rather, God wants what is best for us. So we do not need to fear God in that way. And yet there are passages in the Bible that say things like, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That kind of fear is not being afraid of God, but something else. For me, the words awe and respect best describe what I think is being talked about there. Whenever I see really huge mountains, such as the Rocky Mountains or the Swiss Alps, I have a feeling of awe that makes it easier for me to conceive of someone like God who is much bigger than I am. Sometimes the feeling happens when I hear a great piece of music or see a, a moving play or, or view a great work of art. And there's a feeling of awe there that, that points beyond itself to something or to someone beyond Sometimes it may even come in the form of something quite small, like a, a newborn baby or a, a purple flower. When it comes to that kind of feeling, I think the fear or the awe of God we experience is a good thing. Maybe even to the point that the angel might rightly say to us, be afraid, as in, don't ever get to the point in life that nothing ever takes your breath away or pulls you outside of yourself to the transcendent, to God. You see, the not part of be not afraid is grounded in the good news that these angels bring. It's the good news that God loves each one of us and that God loves this world and that God has sent Jesus as God in the flesh to live among us, to grow up, to show us how to live our lives in relationship with God and with each other, and that Jesus will one day give his life on a cross and be resurrected in order that God's plan to save the world can be worked out. That is amazing good news. And it's the reason why the angels can say, be not afraid. Because God is at work, we no longer have to live our lives afraid of a kind of God who's out to get us. Nor do we have to be afraid that something in this life will ultimately get us. As Paul reminds us in his letter to the church at Rome, he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus Nothing. So, this is not a don't worry, be happy, ignorance is bliss approach to life. No, it is grounded in these events of the first Christmas, events that continue to work their way out through all of history and into our lives this day and beyond. If God has indeed been born into this world in the form of a man, then Everything has changed forever. Everything has changed forever. That's good news that can affect how we live our lives today. I thought it was interesting in that article from the Wall Street Journal that when the expert was asked for advice for those who thought their children were thrill seekers, he re recommended a rock climbing with supervision. Actually, I think that seems like a good way to think about our lives today. Now, I have to confess, I have never been rock climbing either on those walls indoors or out in nature, but I've seen it done. And if you've ever seen it done, you know that they first put a harness on you and then the experts strap you in very securely. Then they test it out to make sure you're connected. Only then, and only then do they let you start up the wall. First, you, you place your foot in one place, and then you use your hands to grab a foothold farther up, and then you start to work your way up slowly. And when you get stuck somewhere, and from time to time we all get stuck, when you get stuck, the expert on the ground can help you find a better way up. 
they can see the big picture and see things that you may not be able to see when you're, you're climbing that wall. So you work your way up higher and higher. But the most important thing to remember as you make your way up is this. <laughs> there is someone holding on to the other end of that rope that is attached to your harness. And if you fall, you may slip a few feet, but you'll not fall all the way down. There is someone there to catch you. There's someone there to catch you. Now, the experience may still be just as thrilling, even when you know there's somebody holding on to the other end of that rope. If you are 50 feet off the ground, and um, it's hard to tell your brain not to be anxious. And if you slip and fall even a few feet, your heart still races. But deep down inside, you know you will be okay because there is someone holding on to that rope who will not let you fall all the way. And it can give you the courage to keep going and to take the risk, even if you are afraid. There may even be a little voice inside of your head saying, be not afraid. When we face things in life that make us afraid as Christians, we can keep going knowing that God is there holding the other end of the rope. We may slip and fall a few feet, but God is there so that in the end, we will be okay. <clears throat> That's God's promise that, that began when Jesus was sent into this world by God to be born. That's the good news that can help us not be afraid. There's an old Indian fable about a little tiger that lost its mother. A flock of goats saw the tiger and had some strong paternal instincts, so uh, they decided to adopt the tiger. So the, the tiger grows up thinking that it's a goat, learns to bleat like a goat, to eat grass like a goat, but because grass doesn't nourish it very well, it grows up to be a pretty poor goat. When the young tiger reaches a certain age, another male tiger pounces on the flock of goats. They all scatter, except for the tiger who thinks he's a goat. He is both afraid and not afraid. The big tiger looks at the little tiger and says, are you living here with these goats? But all the little tiger knows how to do is to make very bad goat sounds. So the older tiger just kind of swats him around a few times thinking this will have some effect, but the little tiger just keeps making goat sounds and eating grass. So the big tiger takes him to a nearby pond. He lets the little tiger see his face for the very first time. And then the tiger puts his own face next to the little tiger's face and says, you see, you've got a face like mine. You're not a goat. You're a tiger like me. Be like me. So the little tiger gives a little tiger stretch. It's first one, and then its little tiger roar comes out. And the big one says, there, <laughs> now you've got it. Friends, I think many of us, many of us are afraid because we just don't know any better. We've spent our lives living as goats when God says to us, we were created to be tigers. In other words, you and I were not created to live our lives afraid of what might happen next. God created us to live like tigers who, as far as I can tell, don't seem to be afraid of much of anything. We can do this because God is holding the ropes as we climb the rocky walls of life. We may even slip from time to time, but God promises to be there holding onto the rope so that in the end it will be okay. So we can trust God and not be afraid. Maybe we can even let out a little tiger-like roar. So if you've never opened up your life to God, the God who sent Jesus in this world to transform your life, the God who sent Jesus 
to even save the whole world, I want to invite you to, to stop living like a goat and to let God into your life. I can think of no better time than Christmas Eve to do this. And when you do that, know that when you let go and you take that leap of faith, as scary as it may seem, God will be there holding on to the rope so that you'll fall gently into the arms of God. In the strong name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you join with me in prayer? We thank you, God, that you not only sent Jesus into the world to show us how to live what we are to be like, what we are to do, but he came to save the world. Gracious God, wherever we, wherever we are on our journey of faith, help us to trust you more. And if we've never trusted you, help us to open our lives to your love and your grace, knowing that we are falling into the arms of a loving God. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Friends, when we hear the good news of grace and hope, it provides us a reason to confess our faith, to say what we believe. So would you join with me in our affirmation of faith using the Apostles' Creed? Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. It's written that they will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in God's kingdom. According to Luke's gospel, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it. Their eyes were opened and he recognized him. This is Christ's table. And where you are, we believe that Christ's table extends even to where you are now. So we encourage you to take the bread and the cup as we prepare to celebrate communion. We set apart these ordinary elements, this bread and this cup, to a holy use and mystery. And as Jesus shared a prayer of thanksgiving with his disciples, let us join together in prayer. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You send him into the world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior to bring freedom to the captives of sin, and to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering. We rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promises of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ our host. So gracious God, pour out your Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ, a foretaste of Christ's heavenly banquet. And now we join together, Lord, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night of his arrest, took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup after supper. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Who believes in me will not thirst. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let us pray. O God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose birth we celebrate during this Christmas Eve. Amen.
Friends, if we were gathered here in the chapel on Christmas Eve, our tradition is to sing Silent Night at the end. And I would come up front and I would light my candle from the Christ candle to remind each one of us that Christ says that we are the light of the world. During the singing of Silent Night, I'd invite you to raise your candle high. We'd look around. We would see all of the light reflecting on our faces. We'd be reminded that we are to reflect the light of Christ out into our world. We can't do that today. We can't do that this night. But I want to ask each of you to continue to share the life of Christ and the light of Christ wherever you go. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.